So I see Heidegger as an innovator in piety itself, in a way to be pious. A new way to be pious was opened up by Heidegger, mm. which is um, which is not to do with dogma, but which has to do with the individual's willingness to uh, to train his existential gaze, to train his existential aptitude for understanding. Hello and welcome to everyone and uh, welcome to episode four of uh, my free books series. Today I'm very happy to have as my guest Kubilai Excel. I was hoping to have be, to be the first one who has you uh, as a guest on a YouTube channel but uh, Johannes already beat me to it. <laughs> so I will also leave a link to the conversation that Kubilai uh, had with Johannes on uh, Johannes' channel. Listening to that conversation I learned that uh, you have a philosophy degree uh, at McGill University, and yeah. uh, you currently also live in London. Um, anything, uh, would you like to, as part of your introduction, uh, to, to share something about your current philosophical pursuits or interests, things that uh, occupy you? Sure, sure. Um, I'm most interested in phenomenology, which mm -hmm. is a part of philosophy which deals with ultimate questions, uh, but Metaphysics also deals with ultimate questions. Phenomenology deals with them differently. Um, and it has a particular me methodology, which I really appreciate. Mm. Um, so I'm interested in phenomenology and I'm interested in Buddhism. Mm. Um, and I see in them a sort of natural alliance that they should have. And uh, I'm, I'm pursuing that thread. It's a complicated thread, so I don't have much to say about it uh, so far, but I'm planning on writing a master thesis on it. So. Mm. I'll be able to speak about it more eloquently in the future. Mm, great, great. All right. So for this uh, for this conversation, you uh, you were kind enough to select three books for us to talk about. Uh, so please uh, give us the list. Um, I selected the Birth of Tragedy, which is Nietzsche's first book. Mm -hmm. I selected uh, Molière's Don Juan, which is technically a play, mm -hmm. and I selected Being in Time by Heidegger, which is my uh, my main object of concern. Hmm. All right. So uh, beginning with the birth of tragedy. Uh, my, uh, my general, you know, vague uh, intention for these conversations, for this public conversation is to, to uh, let people know who have not read these books, who are interested in uh, books related to philosophy, literature, classic, classic works, to let them know uh, what they can expect if they begin uh, diving into these works. Um, mm. So maybe we can start with that. Uh, Birth of Tragedy. What kind mm. of book is it? Uh, and mm. what can people expect? Maybe you can also weave into that description what it means to you or what you discovered when you mm. started reading it. Sure, that's a great question. Um, the Birth of Tragedy was, was as I said, uh, Nietzsche's first book. I think he was 26 when he wrote it. Mm. Um, at the time, he was sort of best friends with uh, Wagner, a lot of, a, a lot of uh, the book is a sort of panegyric of Wagner as an implicit sort of celebration of Wagner. So I can imagine someone in his 20s, very passionate, very brash, uh, very smart, and very knowledgeable of the subject. He was a philologist. A philologist is someone who is interested in the history of ideas. So that's, that's um, before being a great philosopher, Nietzsche was a philologist and a classical philologist. He was interested in the Greek world more specifically. And so you have a classicist's sensibility in this book. Um, the book is mostly about Greek tragedy. That's the birth of Greek tragedy. The birth of tragedy is the birth of Greek tragedy, as he sees it. Mm. And he makes all sorts of interesting claims uh, in this book. In, uh, interestingly, uh, um, he, he really has no regard for Socrates and, uh, and speaks ill of Socrates which when I first read it, I thought was very, very funny because Socrates is sort of the patron saint of philosophy uh, mm -hmm. and talk of pre-Socratic and post-Socratic philosophy. And that's evidence enough of this. Um, and uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche thought that Socrates ruined Greek theater and philosophy more generally, which uh, was a, an astounding claim to me when I first read it. And the more I got into it, um, the more fascinated I was with the, di the main dichotomy, which is, which is present throughout the book, which is that of, um, the Apoll Apollonian and the Dionysian. And that dichotomy uh, really is a fascinating one. It's the reason why I appreciate the book so much. Um, I would argue that the, the, the bulk of what is said about the Apolline and the, and the Apollonian and the Dionysian 
uh, is in the first half of the book. The second half of the book is more of a detailed critique of, uh, of Greek theater and, 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 and Greek, um, Greek poets and all of that. It's interesting, but what I really like about the book is this distinction. Mm-hmm. As he sees it, um, the, Apple, the, 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 the Dionysian is, Dionysus is the god of wine and intoxication. He's the god of, and, and Nietzsche sees in him something more potent than that, because Nietzsche really gives him the power, the principle of life itself, of its vitality. You see, the, 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 it's the, the ontological sap which runs through the veins of reality, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 very potent. It's uh, to to be to have a Dionys- a purely Dionysian moment, which you can't have because all moments for him are uh, a, a unity, a synthesis of Apolline movements and Dionysian movements. But you can have more Dionysian movements than other. Think of a rock concert. That's a very Dionysian movement, or any concert. If you abandon yourself in the music, that is a Dionysian movement. Because what is eclipsed for for Nietzsche is the Apolline, and the Apolline is the god of dreams. And, and, and forms and light. So, so uh, think uh, what a mathematician does, what, uh, what, a, what an architect does is very Apolline indeed, because it's, it's, all about, it's all about forms, thinking forms. He's the God of dreams. He's the God of archetypes. If you, can, if you contemplate a religious icon, you're having an Apolline movement, uh, an Apolline moment. If you contemplate a work of sculpture, you're having an Apolline moment. Because what you're contemplating is form, um, but what stirs you is Dionysian. So, so you could you could look at a, a Greek, beautiful Greek statue, or, or or any statue. You could look at, let's say, um, the David, and what you see is quite Apolline because the forms are all perfect, and it's an idealized version of the the male body. But what it provokes, the emotion it provokes, is the occurrence of the Dionysian. So you can see this as a very potent very beautiful and very all-encompassing dichotomy, which, t- which really uh, accounts for so many experiences and, uh, and, and the character of so many experiences. Hmm. So, so, the, so that's what I th- found was, was so interesting. It's a, it's a dichotomy which has stayed with me ever since I've read it hmm. and which informs so many of my reflections. Um, I think that a lot of what philosophy helps you to do is birth these tools, these conceptual tools with which you can interpret uh, phenomena with increasing proficiency and increasing subtlety and increasing uh, understanding. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was a very useful tool to, a, to have birthed and, um, and I owe it all to Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. In my experience of uh, reading the book, I uh, felt like he is trying to redistribute the credit that we give. So we give, I think, uh, we give mm-hmm. too much credit to the Apollonian uh, tendency, which is uh, we see people, we see an artist, sitting down with a, with a piece of work and designing, being concerned with work, being concerned with detail, being concerned with uh, individuating, and get, uh, to bring something out and give it individuality and particularity. And uh, the distinction is about two things, one of which more readily comes to us uh, in, in appearance. So it, it shows up and it's more obvious to see it, point to it and give credit to it. Mm. So from, in my experience, I, I felt like, uh, he's pushing our attention to give more credit to the Dionysian tendency, which kind of right. worked behind the scenes. That's right. You're right. And that's in a way why he, uh, why, why he condemns Socrates, because he, he sees him as the, the champion of the Apollonian, which is very true. Uh, the philosophy for a very long time was a abstract terrain. It, it was a very abstract terrain. It was, it was all about... Uh, reflection and musings and that that mode of disclosure is very apollonian mm. um as so he sees that it's a divorce it's a di- it's divorced from life so mm-hmm. it's a, it's a it's a it's a representation of life apollo a, a, apollo is less power than dionysus does because dionysus is the matter of which apollo speaks mm. so you, you you could sort of imagine it this way let's say you're at a party with your girlfriend and an old college friend of yours comes over to this party and he's handsome and he's successful and your girlfriend is attracted to him and he hits on her. And this provokes like a feeling, like an undef- indefinite feeling, a new feeling you've never, you've never uh, experienced before. And let's say that you don't know the word for jealousy. You come from a culture where there's no word for jealousy. Mm. Later, later on, you, 
you're reading a book years later and you stumble upon the word jealousy, you look for it in the, in the, in the dictionary, you read the definition for jealousy and it clicks. Yes. Yes. That's, that's the feeling I had. You know, you, you make that connection and now you have a more Appaline form for that, for that feeling, right? The definition of jealousy, which you can, which you can, that we can, can give it form, which can, uh, which can, uh, which is, a, which can encapsulate it, if you will. But that raw feeling is that of which the definition speaks, right? The, the, that raw feeling of jealousy. If you made a painting of a jealous man, it would also refer back to that raw feeling, which is itself Dionysian. It's more primary because it's the stuff of life, the stuff of your experience of life. Um, so so, so that, that's what Nietzsche is, is, uh, it means. Dionysus should be more valued, or we should value those things which are more Dionysian because they bring us closer to our lived experience of the world, which is in itself more Dionysian. He mm -hmm. thinks that if you, if, if, if the Dionysian has its day, it's a unifying, mo it's a unifying thing. It fuses you in harmony with your neighbor. It's a, it's a, it's something which brings together. Mm -hmm. The, the Apolline is something which individuates. Mm -hmm. It's something which encapsulates, which isolates, which reifies. Uh, and, and so, and so it, it can give you, it can give you icons and it can give you idols. It can give you all sorts of things. It can give you light. It can, it can, cast, it can cast understanding on the, on the Dionysian. But it is secondary because it, it's only ever a commentary of the Dionysian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really like it, that, that image. And based, based on your description, I saw this image of the Apollonian tendency give us, giving us a handle on the Dionysian uh, force. Uh, give us like a, yes. like a pincer or like a grasp uh, so we can deal with them, handle them a little bit better. Uh, which, okay, I, I want to ask you at least one question about so uh, the, the Socratic um, diversion or so Socratic corruption, let's say. <laughs> uh, I think Socrates himself maybe wasn't guilty of what Nietzsche is describing in this, uh, in this book. I think it, it would be maybe closer to say that Socrates' students or some people who might misunderstand Socrates, not seeing or not, not appreciating as Socrates himself is uh, handling something that is real. There is, there is something underneath. There's something real at, a, at stake behind what Socrates is doing. But if mm. people try to mindlessly imitate the form of Socrates or in a scholarly form, they become scholars of uh, philosophy. And Nietzsche also talks about scholars in a, not, not as a compliment. <laughs> Uh, so would you say that Socrates himself is redeemable? And he, he, oh, Socrates he, for me is, is a sort of saint. Um, mm. I, I, I regard him as a sort of saint. He's a saint of truth. Um, because he was someone who, at least in his ideal, the way Plato portrays him, I, the historical Socrates is another matter, but the way in which we remember Socrates is through the eyes of Plato. And the picture that Plato paints of, of Socrates is that of a saint as I see it. The, and, and, and the most... Arguably the most striking thing about Socrates is his death um, because he doesn't resist his death at any step of the way. First, he's accused of corrupting the youth and impiety, uh, crimes for which, he must, uh, for, for which he must defend himself. And, you know, being the, the most skillful uh, thought crafter of the day, he could have very easily come up with a way to absolve himself of, of, of the charges. He could have very easily argued against it, but he doesn't. He sticks to his principles. He sticks to his guns. He tells the truth as he sees it. And uh, he doesn't make any effort to sort of manipulate the crowd to his, to his uh, sympathy. Mm. So he's condemned to death. He's made to drink the hemlock. And all of his, all of his followers come to see him. And that's, the, that's described in the Phaedo. And they're all crying and they're all lamenting and they're all really sad. And he sort of, uh, sort of yells at them for being so sad and says that it's completely inconsistent with his life to feel fear for what comes next. He, in, in, instead, he sees a death as a sort of uh, liberation, a liberation from this fleshy prison which, which, uh, which sort of attached him to all sorts of things for which that he didn't value. He valued, uh, he valued the pursuit of truth, which means he valued this sort of infinite process of abstraction, which took, away, away, um, which took him away from sensuous things and into this numinous world of light. And he, he thought that, well, you know, if I die, like rejoins the like. I have made myself someone who 
who is fit to be in the ether because my life has been a, a celebration and a pious celebration of the ether. So he sees life, uh, he sees death as, as, as bringing him closer to what he loves. Um, so he, he's not scared and, and, and he, he has all these arguments for the immortality of the soul. He doesn't really believe that, that, that uh, death is the end. And he goes with it so confidently. He has this equanimous smile, this, un, this eerie equanimity about him because of the gravity of the situation. You would, you would, uh, you would, expect, um, you would expect panic. You would expect, uh, you would expect fear. You would expect gravitas. You would expect all of these things which are wholly lacking from his, uh, from his behavior. And for me, that is evidence of the fact that the one who has lived correctly as he sees it has nothing to fear of death. It's almost this idea that the, the saint can, can meet his death unafraid, and that is the recompense of his sainthood. Mm-hmm. You see, that, that, that uh, the one who's dragged down kicking and screaming, well, that's his punishment for a life of sin because, mm-hmm. because uh, he can't meet death calmly mm-hmm. as the saint does. Mm-hmm. That's what I see as saintly about Socrates. And that's what I think everybody sees as saintly about Socrates, that in philosoph- philosophy, the, 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 the idea that, 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 uh, that Socrates promotes is that the Socratic way of doing things um, uh, makes your life uh, the kind of thing which is apt for the divine, for the company of the gods. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and this, is, this is a very potent idea which has motivated countless philosophers through the ages because they saw in the Socratic activity or the philosophical journey something which was ennobling, uh, and ennobling in such a way as to, as to um, perhaps foil even the deepest of our anxieties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so speaking of saints and sinners maybe that's a great segue to move to Don Juan <laughs> I just wanted to <laughs> mention one footnote add one footnote to your descriptions of Socrates that is telling uh, with regard to the birth of tragedy and that is one of the last things that Socrates does is playing music uh, he mm-hmm. has a little flute that he plays and that's it connecting, it, connecting him to the Dionysian uh, with music so people can read more about the connection to music too. Um, okay, Don Juan, this is a book I haven't read, but I'm uh, looking forward to maybe reading it after our discussion. Sure, sure. Or even watch the play. Uh, okay. you know, there's all sorts of, uh, on YouTube, there are all sorts of... Uh, mm. Yeah, Don Juan, uh, talk about Dionysian, you know. Don, Don Juan is uh, extremely Dionysian um, because, so Don Juan was this folk hero that appeared in the Middle Ages in Spain, he was dreamt up by this character called Tiaso de Molina, but in a way that's his less important incarnation because um, short after he was made the object of a play called Don Juan by Moliere, which, were, which, uh, which I, I've picked today, and the object of Don Giovanni, Mozart's great opera, arguably one of his greatest operas. Mm. Um, so the, the story of Don Juan is about this figure who, is, who just rushes through life sleeping with as many possible women as he can. He, he, it doesn't matter, old, young, fat, thin, uh, ugly, beautiful, it, it, they're, all, they're all women to him. And he just, he just he, his, his great mission in life is to acquire as many as possible. And uh, at the end of the play, he uh, is dragged down to hell because it was written in a very Christian time. And, you know, that's the natural consequence of a character like that. You can't have a character uh, at that time, you know, at the time of Louis XIV, who behaves like that and who isn't uh, utterly destroyed by the, the, the baselessness of his morals. Mm. But what we find about Don Juan is that he's very charming, he's very eloquent, he's, uh, he's, he's, um, and he's very, in a way, very uh, concerned with aesthetics and the beautiful. You know, mm. it's, it's, he's a lover of beauty and he's a lover of music and he's a lover of life. He's an exuberant, he has this exuberant joy for life. Um, and, uh, and so, when I was when I first read Don Juan was in high school, like all French kids do, uh, you know, the, it's it's part of a necessary reading as a as a as a high schooler in, in you know in the French system, mm. and I thought he was really cool. Mm. <laughs> like when I was seventeen, I I really wanted to be like Don Juan. Uh, sure. I thought I, I I was sort of I was sort of uh, I was sort of I didn't feel very much sympathy for the Christian position. I was raised as an atheist, so for me that was all hogwash. I thought, uh, you know, Don Juan was the one who'd uh, unlock the secret of life, you know, to just enjoy it to its fullest extent. And for years I did. For years I lived like Don Juan is exactly how I lived. Mm. And um, I had a lot of fun. But it's, I, it's something, something of, its, uh, of its emptiness sort of crept up 
a little later when I suffered the consequence of living such a life. And I sort of understood that there's a deeper dimension to Don Juan, uh, which, which was lost on me. Mm -hmm. You know, Kierkegaard talks of Don Giovanni, Don Juan, as the enemy of spirit. He's the antipode of spirit, right? He's, he's uh, the exuberance of life in its sensuous immediacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and so he talks a lot about, about the character of Don Juan. He's fascinated with him, Kierkegaard, uh, because of this. And I think, I think the, the way in which you regard Don Juan has a lot to do with how sympathetic you are to Christianity because there's no reason to disavow the, the ideal of Don Juan lest you really are committed to, to, to the ideal of spirit and the pursuit of the life of the spirit. If that means nothing to you, then Don Juan is someone who rushes through life un, uh, unconcerned and without anxiety, without, uh, with, uh, just enjoying himself and, and making, everybody, uh, making ma everybody around him enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an ideal that, uh, that a lot of people subscribe to. It's the ideal of the super, of super abundant vitality. It's someone with immense, pr immense presence and charisma. Someone who fascinates and captivates everyone around him. Someone, someone when he walks in a room, everybody you know, circles him and asks him questions and wants to spend time with him. It's, it's something that we all implicitly strive towards in our everyday lives, whether we know it or not, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the meek people want to be more like Don Juan. The people who are like Don Juan are very satisfied with being like that. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so whether or not you, you think that there's a problem with being like that has a lot to do with your sympathy for, Christ, for the Christian ideal. And mm -hmm. if you have sympathy for the Christian ideal, then he becomes sin. That's the, the most perfect embodiment of sin. Uh, you know, th th there's a passage I wanted, I wanted to read from Kierkegaard, mm -hmm. which sort of says it much better than I can. He said, in the Middle, a the Middle Ages had much to say about a mountain, not found on any map, which is called the mountain of Venus. There the sensuous has its home, there it had its own wild pleasures, for it is a kingdom, a state. In this kingdom, language has no place, nor sober-minded thought, nor the toilsome business of reflection. There sounds only the voice of elemental passion, the plays of appetites, the wild shouts of intoxication. It exists solely for the pleasure in, in, in eternal tumult. The firstborn of this kingdom is Don Juan. That it is the kingdom of sin is not yet affirmed, for we confine ourselves to the moment at that which it, that which this kingdom appears in aesthetic indifference. Not, only reflect, not until reflection enters does it appear to be the kingdom of sin, but by that time Don Juan is slain, the music is silent. One sees only the despairing defiance which in its impotence protests. So that is wow. uh, what Kierkegaard had to say hmm. about Don Juan, one of the things hmm. he had to say. He says a lot of things about Don Juan. Uh, well, the music, I... Don Giovanni, he, the, hmm. the, he, that's, that's, that's what Kierkegaard is more, um, more interested in. Yeah, that's that was very interesting. Kierkegaard, uh, he seems like he one as he saw as one of the conditions of possibility of Don Juan, uh, Kierkegaard. He saw it as a lack of reflection, which is why he manages to go all the way. Like you, you talked about how we we all like to in some way to be like him, but I think most of us don't go all the way because we cannot. We are we remain half-hearted or we remain hesitant. We are if not. Uh, hesitating because of the Christian or any kind of religious uh, force, at least because of social norms. We cannot f become full-hearted and go all the way, but he manages to fully embody this, uh, this system. And he calls it the principle of erotic genius, mm. which is a cool title to have on your, on your resume, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he says it's the, it's the principle of the exuberance and joy of life. But the tragedy is that that is the enemy of the spirit. Would, would, we would all be so, you know, all of our anxieties would be resolved if there was no uh, tension between the, the, between the life that Don Juan sort of lives mm -hmm. and the life of the, the, the this, this philosopher, of the saint, of the mystic, uh, of the, the man of spirit. If those two things could coexist, we could have our cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. But... They're mutually exclusive. Mm. That's, and, 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 that, and, and therein lies a great sadness for us because we want two things that can never be resolved at the same time. We want the stern, uh, somber sagacity of wisdom and we want this exuberant joy of life. 
perhaps there are people who can join this in one experience, but I would call them enlightened mystics, enlightened saints, something like a, like a bodhisattva maybe, I don't know. Like, uh, the, 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 the unity of opposites is a very potent thing to think about and how it can be achieved. Mm-hmm. I guess, I guess in the end, we, we, that's why we have, we find so much, we have so much interest in the concept of balance because it's, or yin and yang, because it's about this great balancing act between, between forces that are antipodal, but vital and necessary and, and beautiful in their own right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I think you, you should think of these things like, like, like poles. Don Juan is a pole. It's a type of way of being, you see that if you embody fully, you'll miss out on all sorts of great things. And right. the reverse is also true. You know, if you're too draconian, if you're like a Franciscan monk, you're missing out on all sorts of incredible things as well. So, so all of these are poles. And I think that the, a lot of mistakes that we make, at least as I see it, is trying to embody any of these ideals fully hmm. because, uh, because they all exclude things which are also great. You know, it's a, you, to, to, to strive too much towards an ideal is to eclipse all others. Hmm. And I think, uh, I think it's more interesting to, to be a tourist and to, and to explore so many different poles and realms and ways of being. Um, right, right, yeah. But of course, the, the thing that we let go of in that case would be a total commitment and total loyalty to any one system, which, you know, is, 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 might be its own sacrifice. Yeah, sure. uh, but listening to you, I, uh, I saw how one can read Don Juan as a, as a kind of literary embodiment of the birth of tragedy. Yes. Because it, seeing that the opposite poles, we can say they, they either cannot meet or when they unite, it, they unite to give birth to tragedy, which is a, you know, not a happily ever after scenario. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, Don Juan, any, any, anything else about Don Juan before we move to uh, being uh, into mind? The play is very funny, despite, of, just, despite how I portray the play as a comedy. Mm. And uh, Moliere is a hilarious man. Uh, Perhaps one of the funniest uh, that, that I've encountered. You know, he 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 made everybody roar with laughter. Hmm. Um, so the, the play is entertaining as as well as thought provoking, and there's a whole um, literary and musical universe surrounding this character, which makes it worthy of of pursuit because it's not an iso- the understanding of the play is not isolated to the play itself. Right. I guess like all other things, but yes. there's a lot of interesting things surrounding it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's Mozart, there's uh, this medieval literature, mm-hmm. uh, and much more. You know, he's a character that's inspired a lot of people, uh, and um, and so one, I think we should get one should get acquainted with. Yes, yes. And you mentioned Kierkegaard uh, and Mozart. I, I remember also reading in Albert Camus' uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. He also has mm-hmm. uh, some things to say about Don Juan, and how mm-hmm. he's he is one of the figures that he admires, living an absurd life, a, a kind of life that is self-authenticating it justifies itself just by virtue of being it doesn't need justification from an external source Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah okay i'll check it out i'll read it uh, in a matter of days (laughs) from now (laughs) so being on time probably the heaviest uh the the book that has defeated me several times (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, being in time out of all of the books that I read at university was the one that fascinated me, intrigued me the most. Mm. Uh, it was also the most difficult that I read. Um, so since I, it's been a year since I've been, you know, very involved in it. So I guess my, my understanding of it has somewhat waned, which is uh, due to the nature of the, uh, of the philosophy itself, which is one which really uh, demands a lot of patience and attention and which can't be just brought back to mind like a date would be, you know, like something, something, you know, a piece of information, mm. but it's a, it's a muscle which you, you have to, to, to work and which can very easily become atrophied, which is very worthwhile in my opinion, mm. because he, he answers with what seems definitive lucidity. A lot of the, the questions that philosophers have been asking themselves uh, through, throughout, you know, the course of philosophy itself, you know, he, he, he's a radical departure from the way in which philosophy was done before. And, um, and it, the, uh, the inquiry to Heidegger uh, yields so many sort of very interesting fruits. And um, I'm not done with it yet. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so there's still much more for me to understand. These are the kinds of books that people spend 30 years reading and never feel like they've really uh, exhausted all of the, uh, the insights that they could get out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, yeah. let's, but, let's, uh, pause, let's pause for a moment on what you said, which I think is very significant and very interesting about philosophy and the way 
the work of philosophy stays with you and you can, we, we stay with the work of philosophy and it's different from uh, holding on to a piece of information and retrieving a piece of information. Um, Heidegger had a teacher for a while, Edmund Husserl, who made this distinction between the natural attitude and the phenomenological attitude, or we can also say philosophical attitude. And uh, I think one of the reasons why we cannot hold on as easily to what we get from a philosophical work is because we fall back on the natural attitude, uh, an attitude that is useful for us in our everyday dealings, like you know, actually, actually making a phone call, retrieving a phone, phone number from memory. And uh, it takes effort to go back to a philosophical position, to a philosophical insight, even though we might not be going to that insight for the first time, but it still takes effort. So would you, would you agree with that, the natural uh, phenomenological attitude that it's, it's not, yeah. they are, not only they are, they are different, but it's, they are, it's effortful to transition between them? Absolutely. Um, the, the natural way of looking at things, as I see it, is to assign a purpose to them. Hmm. That's the most natural way of looking at something. So when you, when you look at a bottle, you see it as something which contains liquid. Hmm. And that is co-occurrent with the experience itself you know I, I i don't i there there were theories of mine that said that you saw an object with sensuous properties and that you filled in after the fact mm -hmm. after the empirical event with an intention mm -hmm. an intention uh, and you built it into it i don't think so i think that the intention is built in the primal contact the primal experience it indeed is a bottle and um and th that's how things appear to us. You see cars, mountains, you see trees, you see rivers, and you immediately uh, regard them in some way. And, 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 those, uh, and the regarding of them in that way is sort of natural to you. Um, what, what the phenomenological sort of perspective gets you to consider is that there's a reason why things disclose themselves meaningfully to you. And that it's not because you've invented the meaning, it's because meaning is a part of its very nature. So that's what, why I, 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 I appreciate Heidegger so much. It's because he really resolved this question of meaning for me. You know, the, 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 there was this, uh, the, this for a lot of philosophies concerned with this. What is meaning? How do I find it? What's the meaning of life? What's the, what, what, meaning is, is, is a reoccurring sort of concern for a philosopher throughout his career. But I think Heidegger uh, answers this beautifully. He says, the problem is not finding meaning. The problem is dealing with death. But really, that's, that's, the, that's the issue. Uh, meaning is everywhere. And, and, and you're, you're acting in bad faith if you, if you, uh, if you don't recognize that. Anytime you, any, anytime you, uh, someone, let's say, does something, you ascribe meaning to it. You see meaning in actions. It's, it's not because you've invented it, it's because it's there. Mm -hmm. It's because the world has to be um, understood as essentially meaningful for any particular instance of meaning to be felt or, or, or even intelligible. What does that mean? I'll give, it, I'll give you in, in practice the, what that means, an example. So for instance, let's say you're constructing a birdhouse and you're hammering a nail into, uh, into a piece of wood. He says, the whole meaning of existence has to be presupposed in every stroke. In every stroke of the hammer, you must presuppose that everything in the world is meaningful. Why? Because it has a purpose. You're building the hammer, you're building the birdhouse so birds can have uh, a place to eat. So you've presupposed birds, you've presupposed nutrition, You've presupposed the biological explanation of why grain feeds birds. You've presupposed uh, that it's more pleasant for birds to have shelter than to be outside, so the difference between comfort and, and, and discomfort. You've presupposed so much, but that's just if you're a bird lover. You could do it, let's say, because you've just had an accident and your hand is not working right. You're, you're, you're healing and you're, try, you're testing your dexterity. You're trying to see if you can build something with your hands uh, anew because before you couldn't, it was in bandages. So you've presupposed dexterity, rehabilitation, the medical field, uh, further use for hands. You've presupposed so much. And, 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 or you could say, let's say you, you wanna have a really beautiful lawn, 
right? Because you're, you, you live in a suburban home and you, you think having a desirable lawn will enhance your status. Well, you've presupposed jealous neighbor. You've presupposed <laughs> suburban chic. You've hmm. presupposed so many, so many things uh, in that. And not only that, but everything that you've presupposed has its own world of meaning and references. So think of suburban chic. You're thinking perimeter of the, of the city. You're thinking, you're thinking the, the, the plans of a city. You're thinking of, uh, you know, in, interior aesthetics, interior design. You're thinking, you're, you're thinking of uh, status, status plays. You're thinking, you might even be thinking of biology. You're thinking of jealous neighbors. You're the suburban chic. You're thinking of the history of, 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 of the arts of, uh, of interiors. Mm. The whole world refers to, it, to itself. It's a whole web of meaning. And anything is meaningful because it, par it pertains to the whole in some meaningful way. It inscribes itself there. Mm. Without the whole, nothing could have meaning. You have to presuppose it being meaningful for any of the particular things in the web to have any sort of meaning. Mm. Why would you be hammering if you didn't presuppose all of that in the first place? So everything that you do is to secure some sort of state for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the, some sort of mode of being. All that you do is, is in service of this. You work, so you'll make money, so you'll be able to afford an apartment, so you'll have the space required to, conduct, to, to live a family life or a love life or an intellectual life that, you, that will bring you some sort of uh, fulfillment in some sort of way for the purpose of living in homeostasis with the universe or whatever else. But everything that you do is done in the service of securing some sort of state for yourself. Mm. And, it is, and it's, 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 it's not that, that, um, that meaning is difficult to find. You know exactly where to find it. Go to the classics, go to nature, go to, go to anything. You know, meaning can be found in everything because everything is an instance of reality and all of its pulsating vitality disclosing itself to you. So really, it's all up to the beholder to the work of the beholder to inquire into the significance of his experience. And if he does so, the world avails itself so meaningfully it'll make you weep, so beautifully it'll make you weep. So, 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 so the problem of meaning for me is kind of a non-issue because mm. I, 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 I know where to find it. It's, it, it, it appears all the time to me. And, and, and uh, that, that, is, that, that has sort of eclipsed itself. The concern is replaced with death because death is the end right the uh, so 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 the end is much more daunting than than the process for me mm -hmm. because because it's the great unknown mm -hmm. you know uh, and 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 it in a way it, it brings it brings so much uh poetic potency to your life to to reflect upon it and it gives it this moral urgency at least for me mm -hmm. that that reflecting on death and your and your potential judgment you know uh I guess it's very Christian, but all the religions have, have a sense of this, of being judged at death. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's really, not, yeah. really gives a, a presciency to, to your moral, to your, to your moral character of your life. Mm. Before, before we move to death, uh, I'd like to see if, I under, if I'm following you, mm. especially that presupposition idea that in, in, an, in the act of hammering a nail, each Act each one each time we hammer the nail, we are presupposing. We are actually expressing that the fact that we are we have presupposed already. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are propositionally stating something in the background in our, of our mind. But instead, by because we are participating, we are participating in a web of events uh, as an agent. That our fact of participation itself necessarily implies that we have. Uh, we have entered into those uh, sets of presuppositions that uh, the fact of our, our active engagement itself is necessarily connected to all those other things that you mentioned. Exactly. And the world avails itself meaningfully to us all the time. Mm. Like, think, about, think about what Descartes thought the world was. This is something Heidegger does in the book. He says, you know, he thought of the world as a sort of spatial matrix within which objects collided with them. That's the world. It's a lifeless void ruled mechanistically by mm. Newtonian principles, right? And that's how science views the world. That's how a lot of us view the world. The world is a huge collection of objects which are moved and collide with each other and interact with each other by certain 
in, in, inscrutable, uh, immutable, if you will, um, uh, f- physical laws. Mm. And that's, that's what the world is. So when you think of what a room is for Descartes, he thinks of it like, a, like, a, like an architect slash scientist. And it's the space between four walls and it has these dimensions and it has this volume. And it has, that's what the room is more fundamentally. Mm. Heidegger walks into the room and says, oh, it's a Cuban cigar lounge because that's how it avails itself to him. Mm. It doesn't, it's not the space between four walls. You know, it's not, it's, it's cubic metricness that appears to you. No, it's a Cuban cigar lounge. And that means something. It's a room which is assigned a specific purpose. It, it smells like cigars. It makes me think of, of tobacco. Uh, tobacco makes me think of all sorts of other things. It makes me think of communism. It th- makes me think of South America. It makes me think of all sorts of things. This, this room has a meaning which springs from the room itself. It is not a lifeless void onto which I artificially project the purpose of being a Cuban cigar room. No, I live it as a Cuban cigar lounge the second I am made aware of it. And the, the, the fact that it is that has reasons. Reasons which are, uh, which are property, which are endemic to the, the thing itself. And if you reflect on those reasons, you get to travel all over the world. And you get to, you get to imagine, uh, what, are there other kinds of smoking rooms? Yes, there are. And, and there are different kinds of smoking rooms that are not Cuban. And you smoke the pipe and they have a different air to them and feel to them and history and reason for being. And so the, the world is way more meaningful than we can possibly fathom. It's just that we're lazy and don't extract from it as much as we can all the time. We deal with the world unthinkingly because it's the easiest way to go about it. But were we to make efforts about uh, and try to notice why the world presents itself in the way that it does, we would be, you know, touring the universe with our minds, seeing grander and grander things, making connections which are interesting to note and and maybe worth writing about. Mm -hmm. Um, We would be inspired to write music or poetry. We would be inspired to travel. We'd be inspired to do all sorts of things because our lust and, and, and quest for, uh, for meaning is uh, endless. There's never, it's never fully satiated because the world is so vast and so full of beauty and, uh, and intricacy. Mm-hmm. So, so I, think, I think what really Heidegger encourages you to do is to train your gaze. It's to train your eye to be the kind of thing which understands what it looks at in its own terms. Mm-hmm. It's to be the kind of thing which encounters things in a way which extracts from them a maximum of significance mm-hmm. and a maximum of insight. And you can do that. You can train yourself to, to have very far reaching, a very far reaching eye. You can't do that if you conceive of the world as a lifeless void. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, uh, because then it's all, you're looking always at the same thing, carbon, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, uh, photosynthesis, whatever. You're always looking at examples of universal principles, which uh, can show you nothing of their uniqueness and uniqueness there is. Mm, that's great. So, uh, let, me, let me make a parallel, draw a parallel between the cigar lounge and uh, another fact of life. So uh, just like how you said that one person enters into a cigar lounge and they just sees a geometric shape, uh, four walls and uh, the cold. No, the that's cold. Right. no one enters into a cigar lounge and sees they, a geometric Maybe Descartes. <laughs> they try to think about what it is a lot of people will think about it that way. I, right, right. And they'll mistake that event of thought for the essence of the thing itself. Mm. You, 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 when we think, we think that we've gotten closer to the essence of what the thing we're thinking about is. Right. We think that the event of thought is more ontologically potent than the experience that the, to which the thought refers. Mm. Um, Heidegger doesn't think that. Heidegger thinks that we understand reality just fine in our most unreflective mode of being in the world, which he calls average everydayness. This is you at the bank. This is you in autopilot, when you're not thinking about the world, when you're just dealing with it. Mm. That's a mode of being in the world, which understands the world. You understand cars, you understand people. Oh, here's the love of a mother for a child. Uh, You understand with your gaze. It's the knowingness of your eye. But there's an infinite profundity to to this if you can train it. If you can give that eye more, uh, more, more of a far-reaching character, right, right. Which, and which uh, brings average, us to... he starts from there. He starts from what you're, you know, how you feel about life when you're unwrapping a piece of chewing gum, when you're walking to work, when you're commuting to work. this average everydayness is, is the starting point for his for his refle- for his philosophical reflection, which is mm-hmm. astounding. 
mm-hmm. astounding that, because it's completely overlooked by philosophy. Mm-hmm. In philosophy, average everydayness is, in a way, uh, they, you know, you call it the humdrum monotony of of of, uh, of the normal. You know, mm-hmm. you call it uh, you call it uh, you, you call it the everyday, the mundane. You know, and you there's a there's a pinch of of disgust and a pinch of disdain because the philosopher is the one who's supposed to be able to see, you know, to, to dwell on Mount Olympus with the gods and, and talk of higher things. Mm. And so, uh, so he sees it, the fact that he has to descend back onto earth to eat and shit and sleep as, a, as, a, as, a, as something that disturbs his, his, uh, his otherwise blissful repose in the ether uh, of, of, with all of these noble thoughts and all of these grand musings. Um, Heidegger has, has no such snobism. There's no, there are no ontological cool kids which have more potency than others. They're all great if you can learn to look at them in, in, with honesty because every moment that you live is a process in which existing exists. You exist, therefore you know what existence means implicitly. Mm. It's just that the explicit expression of this implicit knowledge is the most difficult thing in the world to achieve. Mm. So basically Heidegger says, that you're already, uh, you're already much more equipped to understand being than you think that you are. And that, uh, that insights shouldn't be drip fed from the, from the divine, from an abstract source that you can barely understand. Insights about the divine are the most implicitly understood thing of all. So Heidegger gives you, in a way, the, the infinite architecture of the mundane, the infinite profundity of the normal is what uh, what, what Heidegger gets you to see. In a way, Zen philosophy does that too. Zen, Zen Buddhists. That's why I, I was so struck by the connection between the two, because it, it seems to me that what Heidegger is saying, the Buddhists have been saying for a very long time, at least some of them, that there is, uh, you know, they, they asked, uh, I think, Bodhidharma, who, who founded Zen Buddhism in, in Japan, they asked him, what, what, what is it... Uh, what is it like to, to dwell in the sacred places, you know? What is it like to, what is the sacred like? What, what is the sacred character of the world like? Something like that. And he said, nothing sacred about it whatsoever, uh, which, is, which is puzzling, but I think is, is, is revealing. Um, it's not of, you know, like at the end of 2001 Space Odyssey, a void of flashing colors and lights. Uh, that's not, that's not what, what enlightenment is like. Enlightenment is this, understood, properly mm-hmm. it's the world you're already in but understood properly mm-hmm. understood for all of its grandeur you know the uh the 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 the, the sage is the one who understands uh the infinite profundity of what it means to just simply exist to just simply exist and he he, he knows that in everything that he sees there is the whole world discloses itself to him i think that's what it is uh, at least for Heidegger, you know, for mm-hmm. Heidegger, you can see the entire universe in any particular instantiation of it if you train yourself to. And I think that this uh, this manner of extracting significance from the world is his greatest contribution to uh, to philosophy, and at least as I see it, mm-hmm. his greatest contribution to my personal uh, worldview. Mm-hmm. And uh, this this training of the uh, of one's gaze, I, you train your gaze in order to create and maintain a better fit uh, between our engagement and the world, the, the, the world of existence. How is this related to our appreciation of death? Is it, is it the case that the more we extend our gaze forward, the more we engage, the more we understand better the facts of our existence, the, the more we become aware and appreciative of our mortality? Uh, no, I think it's the reverse. Mm. I think that for Heidegger, um, the the contemplation of death is what gives all of life its, its, uh, its true meaning. I think that that's what it is. I think that he, he says that we never think about death correctly. That mm. really that we're, we're, our, all of our conceptions of death have to do with alleviating the anxiety about death. And that they're geared towards this. And that, you know, one of his uh, famous uh, quotes is that as soon as one is born, one is old enough to be dying. It's very true. You're always dying. Mm. Death is not something which, uh, which is an event at the end of your life. It's something which occurs any, any moment that you're alive. Death is co-occurrent with life. It's the other side of the coin. To know this is 
no big deal because we all know this. We know this soon as we're, as we're seven, you know, to, and, and to, we can know it philosophically in a more poignant way when we're a bit, we're a bit grown up, but we don't really know, but we don't realize it. That's the difference. Like the, the, to know something is who cares about if you know something, you know, you can know a million important things and be a total idiot. No, the, the important thing is to have realized it, to have let that knowledge be lived uh, for the truth that it is, you know, uh, for instance, I can, I can know that sex is pleasurable, right? When I'm a virgin, what does that mean of my understanding of sex? It's nothing compared to the understanding I've had after the experience. And then I, I realize that sex is pleasurable. I don't mm. just know it. Mm. Now, I, so the difference between knowing and realizing is that grand, I think. And Heidegger wants you to realize that you're dying. And he says that when you do, uh, when you do, the world will appear to you differently. Just as the world appears to you when you're an unthinking being, and it appears to you poorly, it appears to you as something plastic, material, lifeless. You know, you know this, the, 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 all the people who talk about the world being meaningless, it's because you're empty than you, that you think that. It's because, you're, it's because you're, you're vain. It's because you're shallow that you think that. The world wouldn't appear to you that way if you were, if you were less vain, if you had more substance. I don't think you would be a nihilist if you had more substance, mm -hmm. sub character, you know, if you had more faith, if, if you had better qualities, if you were, uh, if you had a better understanding of death, the world would appear to you as poetry. It would appear to you as art. Nature would appear as art. The, 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 you would, you would look at a, you would look at a city's uh, map and you would see lyrical verse. You would, you, you, you would find poetry in every event. You would find human existence to be the most, beautifully futile thing in the world. And this is, this is what Heidegger thinks. He says that everything that you do has a purpose, but existence has no purpose. Hmm. And there's an absurdity which, 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 which uh, arises out of that. That's why he's called the father of existentialism. It's for this insight. It's that everything you do signifies, but your existence itself has no purpose. So whereas everything that, that, that you see, you assign, it, you assign to it a purpose, you yourself have no purpose. So, so they, they, they say, they, there was an interview of, of, uh, of Bobby Fischer, for instance. Bobby Fischer uh, was a great chess player. And um, they asked him, so why do you, why do you play chess? You know, why do you, what, what is it that compels you to play chess? And his answer was great. He said, just to play better chess. <laughs> and, and so in every, particular, in every particular chess game, Every move is significant. I'm doing this to block off this corridor. I'm doing this to protect my queen. It has a, it has a, it has a strategic significance, which is understandable within the games of the, the rule of the game. But it, there is no grander strategy into which all of these individual moves fall other than just playing chess better with mm -hmm. increasing proficiency. And I think that that's what Heidegger is saying. It's that life begets better life when it's lived well. Mm -hmm. And that your purpose should be to come to grips with your mortality. And, and you will see that around this endeavor, the world will, will shape itself into art for you. Because it's heartbreaking, right? The tragedy of the universe is so profound that the light which accompanies it and which makes it bearable must be that grand and that beautiful. And so there's a recompense for your, for your, your willingness to suffer. That's how, in a way, what I see... Uh, Jesus is picking up of the cross and, 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 and going up to the and, and going up to the mountain. That's what I see. That's about. You must willingly be will be be uh, ready to suffer the the consequences of having an honest relationship to your human existence, which is despair, which is uh, disquietude, unsettledness, mm -hmm. which is uh, uncertainty, which is doubt, which is toil, tumult. Right. But the recompense for it is as divine as the suffering is potent. You will, you, you will, the angels will sing to you and the world will, will, will present itself as poetry for you. Mm. And you will know that you've lived well and that you, you might even, you might even uh, overcome sadness. You might, you, you, might, you, might, you might live your suffering with, uh, with a stoic nobility, which is overcome the sadness of it. You might see what the necessary in it. Mm. And then there you might see the, the the whispers of, of God's plan for you, that you be this kind of thing, this kind of noble thing, 
which appreciates the poetry of the world and does so in, in, in relationship to his own mortality. Mm -hmm. um, so I see Heidegger as an innovator in piety itself, in a way to be pious, a new way to be pious was opened up by Heidegger, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is not to do with dogma, but which has to do with the individual's willingness to, uh, to train his existential gaze, to train his existential aptitude for understanding. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, it's up to you, it's up to your effort. So this leads me to believe that the great moral dichotomy is not between right and wrong or good and evil, but between easy and difficult. Mm -hmm. I think that that's always the, the choice. There's an easy choice, less virtuous, and a more difficult choice, more virtuous. And that's what it is. It's, it's your willingness to expend great efforts in the direction of understanding and virtue. Mm. If you do that, you will be recompensed with understanding and virtue. Seek and you shall find. It's in the Bible. You know? I agree with that. I think that, that whatever you seek, you find if you seek honestly enough and with enough persistence. Mm. Mm. And um, that's a beautiful fact about the universe. And there must be some, given how tragic your conception is, you know, <laughs> this, 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 mm. this, uh, this coexistence of immeasurable tragedy and immeasurable beauty is what made me believe in God. I didn't, I didn't, you know, when I was young, I grew up an atheist and I changed my mind because mm. of this fact, because I noticed that this was a part of the very struck architecture of reality, that there is both coexisting uh, a terrible tragedy and an immeasurable beauty. Mm. And that for me is, in itself divine. I don't need other explanations, other, 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 um, you know, other reasons to believe that, that God exists other than the fact that that is the, the fact of your existence. Mm. That the more you, the, the, the more efforts you expend in the direction of virtue, the more beauty you get to see. Now, it seems intended. It seems just. It seems moral. It seems like that's how justice actually occurs. Uh, for me, justice is, is that very fact. It's not the fact of escaping worldly consequences for, for, uh, for worldly sins. It's the fact that your, your own punishment is that you don't get to dwell in those empyrean places. The, 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 the grace of the universe is lost on you. You don't get to participate in it because you've made yourself filthy and unfit for it. Mm. So I think that that's really what it is. The, the, the murderer's punishment is not prison. It's to be a murderer. And, and, and that disqualifies him from a, an array of, 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 of potential graces that could have been bestowed up upon him had he not done that. Mm. That's how I see the justice of the uh, cosmic justice. Mm. It's mm. Your, it, your, your, your ability to participate in grace or not. And, and this has to do with, with the effort that you expend or not mm. in the direction of, of understanding of, and nobility. Mm. So you, you see life itself containing its own uh, justice. Life yes. itself has its own uh, way yes. of... Uh, That's the quality of your gaze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the justice. Mm -hmm. It's how great, how great your, how, how much your gaze can extract, mm -hmm. how much you can see, because there's no limit to how much you can see. It's limitless. Mm -hmm. There's no limit to beauty. There's no limit to God, to, 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 to goodness, and there's no limit to sin. They're infinite in all directions. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the, the greater your effort, the greater the reward. That's my, that's my uh, view of morality mm -hmm. as I see it today. Also that, inspired mm -hmm. by Heidegger. Wow, that, that is congruent with what you said about the choice primarily being between uh, what is difficult and what is easy. Because what is difficult affords most amount of engagement, um, most, in most intense life, most inten intense way to be. Uh, and for its own sake, because we get better at, li uh, at being alive and living. Exactly. Um, great, and uh, that itself also is now a justification of why we should read Heidegger, <laughs> because it is difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Because it is not easy. Absolutely. It's a mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely worth it if you have the patience for it. The prose is uh, obtuse and it's, it's, a, it's quite a nightmarish book to read. Uh, if you're French, don't read it in French because it's even worse in French, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can get over the... If you can get over the prose, I promise the second half of the book is easier to read than the first. Mm -hmm. Because the first is... Uh, he's He's defining all of his concepts. So you have to birth these tools, you know, much like the dichotomy I talked about before as it was a birthing uh, the, of, of uh, the Apolline and the Dionysian. You have to birth all these tools. What does it mean being in the world? What does it mean, Dasein? 
what what, what, is, what is what do all of his words mean? Mm. That's the bulk of the conceptual uh, work that you'll you'll do, the intellectual effort that you'll do. The second book is to use those tools towards understanding reality itself, and it really feels like you're you're drinking the sap of reality itself. You're touching on nerves. You're touching mm. on things that are actually real. You're 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 taking being itself as the body for dige- for dissection, which feels different philosophically from what you've been doing before, which was empty spectral abstractions. That's the problem. That's the problem with trying to think of being, to think of being, metaphysically. It's that it always seems like that ever receding horizon that you can never grasp. It seems like the end point of an endless uh, effort of abstraction that the geniuses are closer to, to, to understanding, but never fully do. It's, mm. it's, the, it's the elusive white rabbit, which you can never really, never really catch. Mm. So the problem is not on, it's not on the horizon, it's behind your eyes for Heidegger. Mm. It, it's, not, <laughs> it's, not beyond, it's not outside of you. It's always what is implicitly at work in any experience. And so that understanding being is understanding the very complex architecture of your reality towards the world, of your, your, your relationship towards the world, the very complex architecture of your relationship towards the world. Mm-hmm. And therein you'll find what you're seeking, not beyond, beyond the ever receding horizon of mm-hmm. conceptual abstraction. So it's a very different method. It's a very different way of thinking about being, of going about the project of, of thinking about being. And it reveals for me better fruits or truer to life, you know, and, and uh, I like that about it because the, the problem with, with being uh, someone who's too involved in Cartesian thought or Kantian thought or something like that is that you come to divorce yourself from life, I think a little bit, and, and, and you prefer, your, you prefer your, your light and crystal palace to the humdrum monotony of, uh, that, that you're sort of forced to bear with. Whereas in Heidegger, you come to love your, your uh, uninspired moments because they're all a part of life. And you come to you, you come to find uh, to you come to redeem the mundane mm. in, in light of the divine, I, and I think that's I think that's a very beautiful thing to pursue. So if you have the stamina for it, you know, do, by all means, uh, do read being in time. <laughs> uh, great, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for this very inspiring conversation. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>